This is Wells Tech, a weekly show exploring the intersections of technology and ministry. Your hosts are Sally Draper and Martin Spriggs. Wells Tech is produced by Wells, the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Welcome to Wells Tech, everybody. This is episode 550, recorded on May 22nd, 2018. I'm Martin Spriggs, and you've joined a show, as you maybe already know, about technology and ministry. We call it Wells Tech, um, and uh, I don't do this alone. I'm usually, in fact, uh, there's, I can only think of maybe once or twice where we've done these things solo, Sally, and that's a good thing because I... I I think it's always better with two or more, usually more. So Sally Draper is joining me as usual. Hey, Sally. Good afternoon, Martin. Happy to be joining you for the 550th time on Wells Tech. What a blessing. What a nice round number and um, kind of an end of an era for me. Which era is that? It is the era of podcasting from this lovely uh, home office that I've been in for several years. Uh, it's Starting next week, my plan is to be podcasting from a, a podcast office on wheels because we will be transitioning to our new home, uh, which is a, a motor home, and uh, going to go ahead and get started with uh, trying out the podcast from that location and hopefully troubleshooting any problems we run into. So, so we're going to lose the, uh, the monkey cookie jar and the D and the... Yeah, all this lovely... All that yes. stuff. Yep. I have something new and exciting planned for you, though. Well, really that's cool a tease. Background. That's nice. I'm looking yeah. forward to that part. Also, it'll probably be really small because it's, <laughs> it's not a big space. But um, yeah, I, I hope it'll look good on camera. I hope that the quality won't suffer from uh, going mobile. You can count on the fact that I will have a lot of hardware picks of the week coming up in the coming months because we have done some investing on um, in some new hardware to make the internet work no matter where we are. And uh doing some last minute testing on all of that and hoping to have it working by next Tuesday. So some mobile technology. Good. Yeah. So that should be enough to keep them coming back next week. I'm sure. <laughs> Witness but, epic fail. Hopefully not. <laughs> but we have an episode 550 to run here this week and uh, actually kind of an end of a little bit of a stretch and era here where we were interviewing some seminarians, seminary seniors are asked to write a senior thesis or a senior paper. And uh, we kind of uh, thumbed our way through all the ones that were done this year for some that might have been appropriate and interesting to our audience. Those that uh, you know either talk about social networks or technology in some way, shape or form. And uh, no exception this week, in fact, uh, kind of uh, an interesting twist on technology where we talked to Julius Bilo about technology who um, was kind of making the case for maybe not using technology. Or not using it um, exclusively. Maybe we could say it that way. I don't think he's against technology, although some of his fellow students maybe <laughs> thought he was coming out against technology. Specifically, Bible study software uh, at the seminary, they recommend Logo software, and students use that in their exegetical studies of um, the biblical text. And uh, Julius had some interesting insights to share about that software usage. And he entitled his paper, Biblical Text Messages, the Effect of Bible Software on Seminary Students. So without further ado, let's take a listen to our interview with Julius. Joining us today on Wells Tech is seminary senior Julius Bula, Bilo. See, I messed up. I'm sorry. You should not Down have me again. do this. Yes, sir. <laughs> sorry. Three, two, one. Joining us today on Wells Tech is seminary senior Julius Bilo. Uh, he is the, the conclusion of our seminary senior interview series, and we are excited to talk to him about his senior thesis. Welcome, Julius. Thanks for having me. Yeah. 
We um, want to dig in a little bit on your topic, interesting topic for a technology podcast. Uh, but before we do that, maybe you should give us a little bit of background on yourself, your family, ministry experience, et cetera. Okay, I kind of took a meandering path, was born in Port Huron, Michigan, was there for a few years. My dad's a pastor, and then he took a call to Benton Harbor, Michigan, so the other side of Michigan. After that, we lived in Sweden for two years. My dad was a missionary there. That's where my mom comes from. So we were there for just two years, and then my dad took another call back to Michigan, Lansing, Michigan. And at that time, I was going to Michigan Lutheran Seminary and on to Martin Luther College. And now my parents are in Carthage, Missouri, in an ELS congregation. Uh, since, since Martin Luther College, I've had a, a lot of fun ministry experiences. Spent a summer down in Georgia doing soccer camps and canvassing uh, while at MLC. And then after MLC, I took one year off to go to uh, the seminary in Germany of our sister synod there in Leipzig. So that was cool, one year there. And then I vickered in Greenville, Wisconsin, pretty close to Appleton, Emanuel Lutheran Church. And Dave Scharf was my bishop before he abandoned me and left for <laughs> college. So <laughs> I followed him there with an emergency call. Uh, so I taught Hebrew last year at MLC. Professor Ness is writing a commentary on Joel. So I got to fill in for him for a year and now I'm almost done, 16 days away from the countdown oh, they, has begun. Yeah. So you got to yeah. lay a little Swedish on us. Do you have any in your, your bag of tricks? Yeah, I'm so glad to be here. And it's spännande to talk more. What? Should I ask what you said? <laughs> glad to be here and happy to talk to you. Sweet. Awesome. <laughs> right. Uh, we're real interested in talk to you, talking to you about your uh, senior thesis, which is uh, very intriguing. Uh, Biblical text messages, the effect of Bible software on seminary students. So you are part of a generation where Bible software has kind of been part and parcel of the whole seminarian experience and an invaluable tool. But you, uh, your research uh, uncovered some interesting information that we want to call a little bit out uh, from you. What, what made you choose the topic, first of all, that you did for your project? How did you come upon that particular topic? Mm -hmm. Well, each seminarian kind of has to come to grips with the fact that study at the seminary is a lot different than Martin Luther College because you're using your computer for your Greek work and your Hebrew work, which you haven't been allowed to use your computer with, really, um, or use your computer for it. MLC. But I really started thinking about it while teaching at MLC because then I had the chance to go back in time and see what class was like again without laptops after being at the seminary for, for a few years with laptops and with, with the Bible software. And that really got me thinking, how can we use what we do have at the seminary in a way that maintains all the hard work that they do at Martin Luther College? So it's a personal thing, of course. I, I went to Martin Luther College, then I went on to the seminary and found that technology could be very helpful. And it could also make things a little, a little easier, which makes things easier to forget. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was a personal thing, but then it was also something that I wanted to think about for the sake of those guys I was teaching junior year and senior year. And I wanted the, them to maintain all the skills that they worked so hard, uh, so hard to keep. So that was a big part of it. And, you know, on the side were the jokes of people, especially once I started teaching Hebrew. Oh, yeah, I haven't used my Hebrew all vicar year. <laughs> 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 or I don't remember any of my Hebrew anymore. So I go, oh, man, could technology be playing a part in these jokes, which have some truth behind them. So that's kind of what I looked at. Interesting. Um, it's been a few years, but uh, Martin and I actually read the book, The Shallows, uh, by Nicholas Carr, and reviewed it on Wells Tech. Over a whole season of Wells Tech, we talked through The Shallows, and uh, we saw that brought up quite a few times in your paper as well. Maybe give our listeners a little recap of the concept of, you know, retaining information and what you learned in your research around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, The Shallows was a great book to read, 
great overview of how technology can get us to skim across the surface is the way he puts it like a jet ski instead of scuba diving deep into thoughts. Um, and what the research I saw said was that our minds are like spotlights and we can spotlight maybe between four and seven pieces of information at a time. And if you don't spotlight it long enough, you're not going to learn it. And if you don't learn it, you're not going to be able to think about it, you know, have good conversations, connect things together. And what the research showed, I'm sure everybody who has a cell phone can agree, is that when you're receiving lots and lots of information quickly, you're not actually focusing on one particular thing. It's like trying to talk to someone while also trying to text someone. That conversation will stay shallow, probably, instead of diving deep because you're not focusing the spotlight on one thing. So that research connected very well to Bible software because what Bible software does well is it feeds you lots of information very quickly. Uh, but the problem then is if you, if you go very quickly, if you don't spotlight individual phrases and sentences and thoughts and, and paragraphs long enough, you're not actually learning them. You're not actually having a conversation with them. They're just kind of flitting in one ear and out the other. Um, yeah. What you call biblical text messages. Did that, did that just uh, pop into your head or was that part of your research that you found <laughs> that phrase? Yeah, that title was done a lot, a long time before the paper was done. So. <laughs> I thought it was catchy. And thankfully the research fit. <laughs> So as pastors are maybe reading your paper and uh, you know gaining some insights on on your research, what would maybe you highlight that they should keep in mind? How might they rethink or do things differently? Mm -hmm. So much of it is awareness, like most things. Everybody's different, so everybody interacts with technology differently, and there are people who use Logos as the Bible software that we use that use it in a way that I would say that's great, don't change a thing. But each pastor should probably ask himself, am I using this technology in a way that helps me or a way that hurts me? And the way you do that is just by remembering what your goal is in any particular setting. So if my goal is to get a good grasp of this text to translate it quickly so I know what it's saying and get as much information as I can from dictionaries and from commentaries and from concordances, I say, hey, good thing you've got Logos because that's going to make that way faster than it would be looking all that up in books, opening the dictionary, mm -hmm. flipping through the pages. So my goal is to get a lot of information quickly. Great, you have a tool for that. Use Logos. But... If the goal then is to take all of that information and to make it meaningful, to understand why this phrase connects to that phrase and why this word is a strange word to use here, maybe there's something behind that, that requires deep thinking, slowing down, careful thought, and technology's bias really is to go quicker, to give you information faster. And it can discourage a pastor to sit and go, all right, you know what? I'm going to stare at this screen for five minutes and keep looking back and forth between those phrases and keep thinking about it. And we'll see if I come up with anything. Whereas usually you say, well, I kind of get it and I'll move on to the next thing. So if a pastor realizes, yeah, when I've got the screen open, I'm, I'm spending less time than I need to to actually crack this text or grasp the Greek and Hebrew. Or when I have my screen open, I usually have email on the side or the notifications that keep coming up. I have to ask myself, is this the best tool right now? And if it isn't, then what else can I use? Can I set the laptop aside and use pen and paper to slow myself down? Can I set the laptop aside and just go for a walk uh, and think about the things that I, that I just read? So the main thing a pastor has to ask is, what's the best tool I can use right now? And 
That is, applies, of course, to a pastor, but it applies to a seminary student too. They're not always doing text study, but they have to ask themselves, how can I use the tools that I have at my disposal to feel more comfortable with the Greek and Hebrew at the end of my seminary career than at the start? And if I am using Logos as a tool, uh, as a shortcut, then I'm not using it properly and I am gonna pay for it in the end. If I'm using it properly, then wow, what benefit am I getting? Because my homework is being enriched. I'm packing in to 15 minutes what I used to have to take an hour to do. And now with that 45 minutes I saved, I can actually think, which is a rare thing <laughs> according to the research. It's, it's a rare thing that people want to sit and think to be understimulated. Um, which is when the best thinking happens. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned research, and I know you did a lot of research into things like uh, The Shallows by Nicholas Carr, et cetera. But there was another element of your research, which I found really fascinating, and that you interviewed um, graduates of the SEM and you interviewed some juniors at the SEM and got their feedback on their use of technology. And uh, that was pretty revealing as well. So any um, lessons learned from that that you could share? Yeah, that was probably the most important part of the thesis because you can read other books, but this is a different situation at the seminary that nobody else has. Nobody had done research like this before. One person tried once um, and there wasn't really any, anything of substance there. So I needed to interview people to actually understand how this applies on the seminary campus. And I interviewed people from the last who had graduated in the last three years. Professor Pauschen guided me in qualitative research. And so he said, it's not about getting tons of interviews, tons of surveys. It's about finding the data rich cases and kind of diving deep and seeing what particular experiences were and those experiences can be representative of what so many people are going through. And so with these five interviews, I kind of had the spectrum of language talent. I wanted to make sure I had middle of the road people, people who had to work really hard and people for whom it came kind of easy to see how they thought technology affected their experience at the seminary in exegesis classes in particular. That means going through the text very slowly, three to five to seven verses a day. And kind of to a person, they knew that it at least affected the way they studied and it affected the way class went. And more of them than not said, yeah, I think I would have at least paid better attention if I hadn't always had the technology in front of me. And some of them said, yeah, I kind of noticed that even when I tried to memorize words like I used to back at MLC, I couldn't anymore. Mm. So people were realizing, I think my brain is changing a little bit and, and your brain can change a little bit. You get used to things, you build habits. That the range went you know, to pretty drastic experiences where one guy said, yeah, I can't even really open up the Greek for John's gospel and read it anymore, which pastors hear and go, what, John's gospel? That's what you learn right at the beginning when you're starting to read the Bible. Um, but he just didn't force himself to focus, to focus and to slow down and to retain things. It's not, it wasn't enough for them to treat the Bible like a Google search engine. You know, oh, I need the answer to that. I'll search it real quick. That's not really learning. But for several of them, that's what the Bible software meant to them. It meant I don't really have to ingrain this in my mind. I don't really have to make it my own because it will always be accessible. I can always search it like I can search a, search a Google search. And I didn't try to tell them that that's an unsatisfying way of studying the Bible, but I could hear their lament mm. when I was interviewing them saying, I wish I could do this stuff better. I wish I could read the Bible more comfortably in the original languages and not feel I, like I have to look up every word or not feel like I have to skip to the English so quickly. 
because people want to enjoy what God has said to them. They want to have some benefit from six years of hard Greek study and, and well, eight years of hard Greek study and six years of Hebrew study. They want at the end to say, you know what? I have been trained really well and I really appreciate what God says through the original languages that I can communicate to my people. So those guys who recently graduated all felt, hey, uh, maybe I can do this a little better. Or, man, that research sounds a lot like my experience. And the guys at the seminary, I just had them do a little experiment. It wasn't drastic. It was just practicing the more thoughtful way that I tried to advocate going, all right, let's use technology for what it's good for. Let's not use it for what it's not good for. And so I had some juniors use technology for, you know, 15 minutes or 20 minutes, however long it took them to gather the information they needed, gather the vocabulary notes, look at the commentaries quickly, look at the dictionaries. And then I gave them a five minute break so they could check their phone or whatever, whatever they wanted to do. And then they were supposed to spend the next 20 minutes looking at the text itself without their computers there, without their phones there, and just sit and think. And if they felt like they had seen enough of it after 10 minutes, they still had to sit and think another 10 minutes because we're so used to saying, all right, I'm good, I'll move on to the next thing. No, 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 slow down. <laughs> and they enjoyed class better to a person. They thought their homework prep was better. They felt more prepared for class. In 45 minutes, you know, not a lot of extra time maybe not more time than they would have spent if they were distracted and multitasking. So they all kind of proved that it's very doable. It doesn't have to be drastic, like take away all the computers. I don't want that. I love computers and I love our Bible <laughs> software. I love that we can talk on Google Hangouts right now, but I also love when people say, hmm, these things have effects and I want to use them properly, just like we do with anything else in our lives. Interesting. One final question for you, Julius. I thought it was very interesting that you put together a uh, an Appendix C, which was answers to some objections, which I'm assuming you had anticipated. What was your thinking in, in kind of going through that uh, effort to, to put that together? I thought the questions and answers were very revealing. Thank you. Um. Objections is maybe a bit strong. Answer to <laughs> all of the jokes that I've heard uh, throughout the course of writing this thesis. I mean, anytime, anytime I said what I was writing about, oh, man, he hates computers. <laughs> and it's all in good fun, but I felt like I had to answer the objections. <laughs> yeah, people say that you hate technology or you're against progress if you're trying to if you're trying to be careful about using it, but I don't, I just wanted to make sure I got that across. <laughs> the line I always say is I've watched all the Logos training videos. Right. I really do know how to use Logos well. There's all sorts of things that I can do on it that I love. So I'm not against technology. And yes, I have heard the objection. You're just one of those smart guys. You know, I'll contend most of the time that I'm not one of those smart guys, but I guess I can admit that I have a little easier time with the biblical languages than some. A lot of it's just consistency. I've been working on it consistently. You know, when I got asked to go teach Hebrew at MLC, that day I was going through my Hebrew flashcards. So it's it's not anything that that makes me sets me apart or that's special. It's flashcards like anybody else. But that objection kind of hits close to home because I taught all of those guys at MLC, and I know they all had different language talents. I saw their quiz grades, I saw their daily work, but I also know that they all earned passing grades and that they all worked hard and they all appreciated when we finally got into the Bible and saw things that they had never seen before. And I feel like people get to the seminary and after putting in all this hard work, they start using technology irresponsibly and they convince themselves that oh man if i didn't have this technology i'd be nothing i can't really crack this text unless i can use the technology at my fingertips and i'm saying guys no it's not about who's smart and it's not about who's stupid at languages it's about the person who can dedicate 
his mind to focused thought. That's why I appreciate Bible study so much because you're sitting in a Bible study and people of all sorts of biblical backgrounds who haven't studied as much as I have come up with amazing insights. And it's the same, the same thing happens with all of these people who have studied Greek and Hebrew. They look at the text and if they put in the thought, they'll come up with an insight that I've never, never been able to come up with but they won't come up with that insight probably if they get distracted or if they move on too quickly. So. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. One of my favorite uh, uh, objections that you had is this uh, is, is uh, going to take too long or too much time without technology. And sometimes I think we all equate technology as a super time saver, being a good steward of our time and resources. And you make an excellent point. Uh, and the fact that uh, sometimes uh, you you want to slow things down, you you need faster is not necessarily better. You know, for a tech study to take a long time is not uh, a bad thing necessarily. The challenge that I see with that, and I'm sure you will see with that in your ministry, is that minutes are very precious in the ministry, as you have meetings every night and. Uh, uh, not just a sermon to prepare for, but Bible study and counseling and you know, a thousand other things where you think, well, I got to get done with this so I can get on to the next thing. And and really, that's a temptation. And I think you put it well here that you really need to uh, uh, avoid. And uh, that's uh, the temptation that uh, so easily you fall into. So excellent point there. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Julius, I think we give you an A plus for your senior thesis. We really appreciate uh, that you took the time to share it with us here on Wells Tech. Uh, very, very good insight that you shared. And we certainly will be praying for you in the coming weeks as um, graduation and call day approach. Long way to get there, it seems. And we're happy that uh, yes. it's there for you. Yes, yes. Julius, thanks for taking the time with us. You're welcome. Thank you, Julius, for taking the time out of the end of your senior year. And uh, as we record, the uh, assignment day is just around the corner. Very exciting time up there on uh, the seminary campus. But uh, an interesting conversation, don't you think? I do think. And uh, I appreciate the insight that he shared and the, the real research techniques that he put behind the conclusions that he came to. That's that's uh, some cool stuff that he took advantage of. And hopefully we can all benefit from that, from taking a little time away from the information floodgates that we uh, work with, not just in Bible study software, but in everything that we do to, to allow us some space for that deep thinking. And uh, I think that's something that came across in the past when we talked about the shallows in particular the book um, by Nicholas Carr and I, I think Julius's paper reinforces that very well so check out the links in the show notes we'll have a link to his paper if you want to dig in and and read through the whole thing um, it's out there on the sim website in the essay files so we'll we'll put a link to that yeah one thing that kind of struck me or at least I you know one takeaway that I had is just don't be afraid to challenge you know what you're doing uh, just because uh, you have a technology at your disposal does not necessarily mean it is in the best interest of what you're doing even if it saves time I and mean, he made that point uh, I think excellently so again thanks Julius for taking that time and sharing your stuff with us Let's move on to our news in tech. And uh, news in tech is um, interesting because we're kind of on the heels of or just out of a, a big news cycle with um, Microsoft and Google having their developer conferences. And typically a lot of information comes out of those events. And uh, it's no exception this year. Uh, this year, uh, Google announced um, something called Google One. Uh, not quite out yet, but this has the potential to be a benefit to anybody using Google Drive or Google Storage. Uh, Google One is expanded storage. Uh, they bill it as expanded storage, access to Google experts, and more in one shareable plan. Be among the first to know when Google One is available in your area. So they have a page here that you can sign up and understand, uh, get notified when 
uh, things are available to you. Number of things that uh, this provides over the traditional Google Drive or Google uh, plans that they have. One of them is uh, more space um, for the money. So you have some different plans. You can get free space online and um, every Google account comes with some free space. But then if you want to store pictures or images or uh, pictures or music files, those kinds of things, you, you might need extra storage. Um, so the fact that they're giving you more storage for uh, less money uh, is, is a good thing. Uh, they also provide um, what they call Google experts. So people who use a lot of storage, tend to use a lot of other Google products too. So one thing that they're going to provide is some uh, help, uh, more accessible help uh, when you're using these products. It'll be a work on like a credit plan so you can uh, use credits to get uh, extra help. Another thing that I'm very interested in is uh, family sharing that has not been possible in the past. So uh, with these storage plans, you can have up to five family members uh, on the plan and they can uh, all store things in their own private storage space that'll add up to whatever uh, storage you have purchased. So look for more information coming up. We'll put a link in the show notes uh, or if you just want to go to one.google.com, uh, you can find out more information about uh, this Google Drive or now Google One storage. So good news for people who uh, are into cloud storage like I am, and I think that'll help uh, those people who want to take advantage of that. So it's in the news. It's awesome. I was just remembering, I thought you used Google storage as part of your personal um, I do. Yeah, I have the 100 gigabyte plan, which actually d remains unchanged with Google One, except I think I may get access to that Google Experts thing that I talked about and, and maybe mm -hmm. family storage. Uh, but if you want to even go higher, so for 10 bucks a month, you can get two terabytes of storage. So that's a lot of storage. Can imagine losing things in two terabytes. But um, the neat thing I read was if you currently pay for their one terabyte, you, you get, get a free two upgrade. Terabytes, for, right, for the yeah, same so you price. Doubled your storage for the same amount of money. Yep. So that's what it's Let's been. Move on, Sally, to Wells now. And Wells is always a happen in place, and that is certainly the case this week. We want to make mention, first of all, of our Wells Education Technology and Leadership Summit that's coming up next summer. We are so interested in having you uh, be a presenter at our summit. And uh, in order to do that, you need to fill out our call for presenter uh, information form that's out on the website at wellsedtechlead.com. And we're looking for your ideas or possibly for you to nominate someone else you might know of uh, that would be a good presenter at the conference. Uh, topics cover everything in the whole space spectrum of education, technology, and leadership. So we're looking for things from administration through vocation and all in between, and certainly lots of uh, technology topics. Security will be a very hot topic. We want to include educational technology uh, topics as well as um, church-focused technology. And so um, social media falls in there. There's just a wide variety. And the problem is time is running out to submit an idea. Your deadline is actually next Thursday, May 31st, to get your ideas submitted um, over on the website. So we really encourage you to consider this. And maybe uh, it's a Memorial Weekend project to write up your presentation idea, whatever it takes. Just go ahead and get your ideas submitted over at wellsedtechlead.com. Or if you want to refer, you know, uh, spread the word and tell a friend about this too that you knew might have something of value to offer, please let them know about it as well. That That's not awesome. all in Wells now. No, happening in place that Wells is. You already made mention, Martin, that this is uh, graduation and call season at Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary. So coming up this Thursday, May 24th, will be the call day service, uh, both Graduating seniors will be assigned to their first pastor calls, as well as uh, upcoming vicars will receive their assignment as vicars for the 
for the next year. Um, all of that happening at 10 a.m. on Thursday, 10 a.m. Central Time on Thursday, May 24th. That evening at 7 p.m., there's a graduation concert. And then on Friday, May 25th is the actual graduation ceremony, again at 10 a.m. Uh, WLS has put together a page with links to all the live streaming of those events, as well as the service folders for those events. So check out our show notes and uh, you can hop right over to the seminary website to, to be a part of those wonderful events happening this week. Great. And then lastly, we wanted to just do a quick reminder about our Wells Tech Skills site at skills.wellstech.net. And this is a place where you can share your skill set, make a posting of uh, different skills you may have in the technology area. And then uh, once you've shared there, uh, people can come and browse the postings and potentially reach out to you for uh, different projects they may have in the ministry uh arena, basically. So uh, we've got all kinds of skills posted here from a lot of different people. And we just encourage you to consider adding your skills to the directory and making use of the directory if you're in need of a technically skilled uh, worker for your project. Great. Yeah, we hadn't mentioned that in a while. And we uh, had a submission just the other day. So I thought, well, let's throw that in there and uh, just make sure everybody's aware that that is a place that uh, you can be found or find those uh, Wells workers. Mm -hmm. Sally, we've reached the point in our show where we have our picks of the week. And as is a tradition on Wells Tech, it's always ladies first. So what is your pick of the week? Thank you Poor very tip. much. Um, my pick of the week is actually an infographic that I pinned on Pinterest. So I'll include a link to the Pinterest infographic. It's titled A Fast Way to Help Guests Feel Wel Welcome. And they use the acronym FAST for Friendly, Accurate, sympathetic and thankful. Just some nice tips you might want to share um, with your congregation uh, and especially your greeters and things in your congregation to, um, you know, think about what you're doing when you're introducing yourself to people. Make eye contact, um, you know, be focused on them. Uh, give them accurate information or find someone who knows the accurate information. Uh, take time to walk them to where they want to get to. If they have a question, don't just point out, uh, go down the hall and turn at the third door or whatever. Um, actually walk with them and be um, attentive to their needs. Be sympathetic to what it feels like to walk into a congregation kind of cold and how hard that probably is and what kind of emotions they're experiencing. And just, uh, you know, reach out to them and listen and um, be attentive to them. And then finally, um, show them that you're thankful. Thank them for being there and show by your attitude how honored you are to serve them as um, their liaison as they visit your congregation. So I think some great tips there in a, in a nice format that's easy to share. So I wanted to make everybody aware of a fast way to help guests feel welcome. Very nice. Uh, my pick is actually a shameless plug, Sally. Um, <laughs> the time is running out for um, our MLC uh, continuing education classes for the summer semester 2018. And uh, I do one of those courses. Uh, so if you are interested in kind of upping your game for um, classroom presentations, and this could be the traditional grade school or high school classroom. It could be a confirmation classroom. Uh, I do a course and I've done it for, I don't know now, probably five, six years, uh, where we talk about uh, best practices for the uh, creation process of slides. And we walk through some of the technologies of PowerPoint and Keynote and Google Slides. Um, we have a great textbook um, that we work through from Gar Reynolds, um, Presentation Zen. Uh, and uh, this year, it's a little bit different because we're doing this over four weeks rather than three weeks. So I think uh, the credit is still the same, uh, but the content is, uh, we'll have a little bit more time to get through the content. And uh, one of the neat things about these classes, they're all online, of course, so you can do it uh, on your timetable. It starts, so this class starts June 4th and goes through July 1st. 
Uh, but uh, there is opportunity throughout the week to get uh, assignments done and uh, participate in the discussions. Uh, just kind of a leisurely way to get through some great content and uh, get prepared for the new school year with some new presentation skills. And uh, it's not just a technology thing, but it's a, a way to uh, better understand how presentation technology can help you uh, create a good and uh, healthy educational experience. So I'm going to give a plug for that. That's EDT, if you're looking for the code EDT8011, Dynamic Classroom Presentations. But I should put in a plug for all the other courses that are out there. Um, our friend uh, Bob Martins has uh, a class on technology for preschool to second grade. And you can kind of see all the other things that are available here. Um, lots of good stuff. Um, throughout the summer in all kinds of different disciplines, educational, technology, mentoring, et cetera, et cetera. So take a look at what's out there. It's not too late to sign up and um, the more the merrier. So take advantage of the MLC's offerings for uh, continuing ed. Excellent. You mentioned uh, elementary, high school and confirmation class. I bet it would apply to some Bible class type presentations. It too. sure would. So yep. all and, kinds uh, of people. Get, uh, I, get, I guess we do get mostly teachers, but there's always two, three pastors uh, that sign up as well. So that's kind of a nice mix. Uh, give us a little bit different perspective, too. So. And I've seen some of your presentations, so I guess I can give an endorsement to the to the teacher because <laughs> you do quite a good job as you um, prepare and present. I enjoy it, so and that's part of the part of the appeal. So, excellent. All right, Sally, we are on to our ministry resource segment. We are, and. Um, I guess it's time for me to give you a few more kudos because I know the person <laughs> behind this, this particular ministry resource. We're going to talk about something brand new um, for mobile or, I guess, desktop experience to get news and content from Wells. And that's the Wells app that's now available at wells.app brand new right. um, domain extension as well. Uh, so this is a reboot of our mobile um app i guess is what you call uh, our mobile call it wells mobile so we right, kind of dropped mobile. the mobile there name and um just given it the app moniker that's what most people called it anyway uh, so we call it the wells app but uh, yeah the the term reboot is actually a, a good um name for it because uh, a lot of the content in it is comes from the same source and that's uh, wells.net we package it in uh, a little bit different container uh, it's not available or won't be available in an app store. You have to go to wells.app to take advantage of it. But uh, you can install it just uh, very similarly to the way you would an app. Um, there's directions usually in the app. Um, whether you're on iOS and Android, it varies uh, depending on what platform you're on, how you install that to your home screen. But uh, once installed, it acts uh, almost exactly like an installable app from the Play Store, from the Apple Store. And uh, it's got uh, all the favorite content, including the devotion, uh, through the Bible in three years, the uh, worship helps, the call list, um, plus all the blogs that are available on wells.net, all the videos, those are all there in one kind of easy to, to find and use package. Um, this is called a progressive web app, Sally. So what that means is that as your browser and your device increases in its functionalities, we add those to the app or the app, uh, kind of lights those up for you and you have the ability to, uh, to use them. It's uh, mobile friendly and uh, responsive in its design so that if you were on a larger screen, let's say an iPad or an Android tablet, it'll format differently and fill the screen for you. Um, and uh, we'll work on many more devices than the apps, um, the, the Wells mobile app that we had in the stores could ever uh, since it is a website, uh, you can get it uh, to work properly on Kindle devices and those kinds of things. And that's really what we were after, to get this in the hands of as many people as possible and not limit them. We do have limited resources here, so we were looking for an experience that could be easy to use and um, hopefully 
uh, beneficial. One of the important features in any app uh, with with content like we have on wells.net is the ability to share it and uh, all of the areas of content can be shared easily from your mobile device or from whatever device you're using. Um, so um, that's a great way to both consume the content and also share share that good news as well. So that was launched last week. Uh, we already have a small revision and there'll be revisions coming out on a very regular basis to get uh, all those features um, in your hands as quickly as possible. If you have feedback, we're, we would love that. Or I'd almost still call it in beta as we're still working out some bugs. So if you find some, please let us know that and uh, watch for new features coming out. That's another advantage too, is when new features come out, all you have to do is load the app again. You don't have to install an update or anything. So everybody gets updates at the same time and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it. I think people will definitely enjoy it. I actually saw some um, some chatter about it out in social media. So I know people have discovered it and are making use of it and are excited about the um, update and the changes that they're seeing there. So thank you for your work on that, Martin. That's uh, labor kind of, of a, love. Yeah, <laughs> kind of something that you squeeze in in between all the other responsibilities you have. So. Right. Um, let's move on to community feedback. Yeah, I uh, had a couple of different personal communications with people this past week that I thought were worth mentioning and sharing with the group. Uh, first of all, I heard from Paul Patterson, who's the principal at Wisconsin Lutheran School in Racine. And uh, he basically was looking to update their interactive whiteboards uh, looking for replacement ideas and experience and everything. He said uh, most of the teachers are on Mac computers. And um, I wrote back and I, I one thing I said was I would mention it on the podcast and see if we got any feedback. But I don't know about you, Martin, I'm thinking that more and more people are moving away from interactive whiteboards more to display type devices. Uh, uh, an Apple TV, for instance, might be the appropriate thing to go along with their, their teacher computers or whatever. Uh, does that go along with what you would maybe recommend? I would say that's been my impression as well. And talking to the folks at MLC, that's definitely, I think, where their heads are at too. We, uh, I think we've uh, even asked that question. I think the last time I was up on the hill of Rachel Feld and um, James Karlofsky, and I think they agree with that in uh, their review or their um, peek into different uh, campuses, and I think that's that's true. But there are other exciting technologies out there, as you mentioned. Um, so I, I think that's probably the the, the, the lane too. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, on the Mac, on the Mac or Apple side, the Apple TV. Um, if you've got a Chromebook school, maybe you want to think about the Chromecast or our products in that realm, so that students can easily project what's on their screen. You know, you can share that projection mm -hmm. and stuff. And so, um, and and then it technically becomes interactive because someone who's projecting could be interacting with it on their yep. computer. Yep. So Air Parrot is another tool that we've talked about, I think, mm -hmm. on the show before um, that uh, they just have version, I got a version out, I forget what the current version name is, or version number is. And then also ref the first Reflector app, Reflector version mm -hmm. three, I think we featured on the show not too long ago, mm -hmm. which works cross platform now as well, which would require you to have kind of a a PC or Mac setup, but then the software running, but then you can uh, connect to it with a code and seems to work pretty well. Very good. I also heard from someone named Jack Draper. Believe it or not, there's a family tie there. Uh, that would be my father-in-law, and he's uh, partnering with the uh, elementary school, the Lutheran Elementary School in his area, Emanuel Lutheran School in Hutchinson, Minnesota, to start a photography club for the students in the upper grades, um, and perhaps even their youth group students that are in high school or whatever. And uh, he had kind of a two-pronged question. Do you know of anybody that's doing a photography club and, and any um, examples to look at of things that people are doing? And I didn't really know of anyone that had shared with us they were doing a photography club. But if you're out there uh, doing photography clubs or clubs 
type after school activities in general in your elementary school. We'd love to hear from you and hear about your experience. His other question was around um, grants and where they might potentially write for some grants over the summer to fund the club um, in the coming school year. And I did remember that uh, we had Jason on once a few years ago and talked about grants pretty specifically. Uh, I went back and looked at some of those resources and it looks like some of them don't exist anymore. So I did a little further digging and I came up with a list from January of this year um, from the Edutopia website slash magazine where they put together what they called the big list of educational grants and resources. So a roundup of educational grants, contests, awards, free toolkits, and classroom guides aimed at helping students, classroom, schools, and communities. And it looks like they're updating it regularly, so you can check back over time to uh, find out about more opportunities here. But summer's um, a good time to reevaluate that and maybe spend a little time writing those grant requests. Definitely, definitely. So yeah, check out this link and thanks, Jack for the question and feel free to share your experience if you have other um, ideas or opportunities for grants or experience with clubs or after school groups in your school. Very nice. Community feedback is a section where we welcome um, you to contribute and uh, that's very easy to do. Uh, if you just go to our show notes page, that's probably the easiest way to, to get uh, connected with us and join the conversation. That's wellstech.wells.net. And um, you'll see there, obviously, all the shows listed and all the links that we've mentioned. You can also comment on any of the episodes, and we'll see that. But uh, we also have links to all the social networks that we frequent, Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, those kinds of things. There's also a link there on the side where you can send us a voicemail, which we get occasionally. That's always fun. Uh, and then if uh, email's your thing, wellstech at wells.net will come right to both of us. And uh, we will uh, receive that email with, uh, with joy and uh, share it with the class if, uh, if that's what you'd like us to do. So join the conversation. That can be comments on anything we've talked about or things that you'd like us to talk about, corrections, uh, mm -hmm. encouragements, uh, whatever. We'd love to hear from you. Definitely. Sally, I think we're to the point in the show where we have and share a, a video of the week. I know it's that's, one of your favorite segments. <laughs> that is, but what you just said sounded like singular, like we were just going to share one, but we actually have two videos of the week this week, uh, starting with a look back at Martin Luther College's commencement activities. Um, a wonderful video put together by our friend John Witte. He was on the show just a couple of weeks ago when we talked about MLC Day and um, his videography skills are shining through on this uh, beautiful video that he put together of commencement. He called Some to Be is the title, and you won't want to miss that. Yep. And um, congratulations to John. He received an assignment. He'll be uh, applying his trade and serving his Lord at uh, Luther High School in Onalaska. So oh, wonderful. congratulations to him. Excellent. And then uh, in honor of the coming events at Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary this week, I found a beautiful flyover video of the seminary campus. Um, background music is I Am Jesus Little Lamb, and they just used a drone to create some beautiful imagery of the campus. And if you haven't had a chance to visit or you haven't been there in a while, this will certainly uh, make you proud of our, our beautiful seminary. It is um, beautiful. Setting. I know it's like a fall shot. I see that the, mm -hmm. the leaves changing. Very cool. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Two videos of the week. For the price right of one. For the yeah. price of, yeah, the same price as everything else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we come to you free every week. That's um, right. Just a little bit of your time. And we do appreciate you taking the time to, to listen or watch. Uh, share, the, share the word that this podcast exists and has existed for 550 episodes. We will do 551, Lord willing, next week. And one of our favorite guest hosts is going <laughs> to join us, Jason Schmidt. And um, we're going to talk about end of year activities, uh, end of the school year, um, lots of different things that are possible to uh, take up some of that uh, 
maybe lighter time. You want to fill a little filler time in the classroom. Uh, Jason comes packed with some uh, ideas there. So always one of our favorite shows as we talk about educational technology. And uh, Jason is going to help us do that once again. That's right. And that's going to do it for episode 550. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we will talk to you in about seven days. Bye-bye, everybody.